Well, good evening again, my brothers and sisters, my beloved. It's so good to be back with you again. We are still uh, on the topic of Psalm 30, number 34, where we are uh, yeah, we're exploring David and his thoughts that he penned about the mighty moves of God and how his praise and worship of God is so worthwhile. And so as we go through this study, I'm praying that all of us will have a, a new sense of awe in who God is and how he just blesses us day in and day out and encourage us that even during these times that we can have some quiet time to concentrate on God and how he just continues to put us on the top shelf. Amen. So let us pray. Father God, again, we come before you to thank you for your love and grace. Thank you for mercy, God, that's new every morning. Thank you for being the God that you are, a God that's not judgmental, but patient and kind. Thank you, Lord, that you give us the ability and the desire more than anything to learn your word. For your word tells us to desire the sincere milk of the word that we may grow thereby. And that's our intention in these Bible studies, God, that as we grow in your word, we'll grow as people. Our righteousness will shine, Lord God. We will be more like you. And we thank you, God. And now, Lord, as we prepare to go into this lesson tonight, I pray that you will open up our hearts and our minds and that Holy Spirit, you will speak through me. Give me the wisdom that's needed to teach this lesson so that those who are in the audience will know for sure what you're saying in your word to them, that they may apply it in their daily lives. Bless us, God, and may you be glorified by what we do tonight. Bless every person that's in tune, and may they be blessed as well. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I said earlier, we're going to continue to study Psalm 34. And the verses that we're going to tackle tonight are verses 4 through 8. And they reflect some of the reasons, not all the reasons, but some of the reasons for David's worship and praise. And they represent his praise in this particular meditation. We know as we go through Psalms that David praises God all the way through. Uh, the psalms that he the psalms that he wrote and so but these are some reasons in this particular psalm number 35 that David says he will bless the Lord at all times and so the purpose of this study is to help us to make practical applications stop right there because I want you to let that soak in for us to make practical applications to the essence of this study and the essence of this study is to encourage us in our walk with God and to learn how to praise him and the benefit of praising. We're going to talk about the difference between seeking God and looking for God. There's a big difference and we're going to try and get into that and explain that as well. And so uh, again, it's to help us to recognize and to help us to remember that we too have reasons to praise God and to worship God. And even in times like this, we don't give up on our worship. We don't give up on our praise because all we have to do is sit back and be quiet. The Bible says, be still and know that I'm God. Just be still, sit down, take some time and let the Lord focus, come become the focus of your time. And you too will, uh, will rise from that occasion feeling so much better about yourself because you know the God that we serve sees all, hears all, knows all. And no matter what the circumstances look like, you're not in them by yourself. God is there with you all the time. And that's what David's going to explain in the remainder of this psalm. He's going to remain, he's going to explain how God is present in our lives in every situation. And you're going to love this study. I, I just love preparing it for you. And I hope that you will enjoy and stay with us every week. We've got about two more weeks to deal with this and that you will stay three at the most. Depends on how the Lord leads us. Um, but you're going to see David's reasons for praising. And I hope that you embrace these reasons too. And then, of course, you have your own personal reasons for praising God. Because we know our relationship with God is personal. It's our relationship. It, it's not me, you, and them. It's us and you and God, me and God on a one-on-one. -on -one. Because he tells us that every knee is going to bow and not bow in a group. And every, knee, every tongue's going to confess. So I can't confess mom or dad. I got to confess my life. So it's a personal reason. And that's why we want to make it practical in our lives on a daily basis to know what God has done and take time to reflect on the goodness of God and how he has blessed us. 
So last week we talked about um, affirmations and what an affirmation was. It's a solemn declaration. And we talked about a declaration mean an announcement and how solemn meant that it was a decree. And I mean, solemn meant that it was like an invocation of, or a decree of help or a decree of, of, of a solidity. Um, and, and so we talked about that last week and the fact that instead of us making a, 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 a resolution to do ordinary things, we're going to be resolute in our praise to God. And so this these four verses relate to that because they give reason for David's praise. Amen. And so we're going to begin reading at verse number four. And I pray that you go along with me. Have your Bibles. Of course, you know, I love Bibles. Uh, and again, I always let you know in case there are new people joining us that we go, we teach from the New King James, but we are, it's all the word, same word, may have a different pronunciation of certain things or that or certain words are changed depending on the translation you have, but it means the same thing. So it's New King James. So if mine doesn't read exactly like yours, it's the same thing. Amen. In verse number four, well, I'll read the first, I'll read all eight verses and then we'll do them individually. Beginning at verse 4, this is David. He says, I sought the Lord personal. Again, this, your relationship with God has to be, it is personal. It's not based upon mama and big mama and nobody else. It's your relationship with God. So David says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. They looked unto him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. This poor man cried out, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. Key word. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in him. So that's what we're going we're gonna to tackle tonight. We're going to uh, uh, discuss this. Verse 4 says, I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears. Now, the question here for you is, what does it mean to seek the Lord? Saw this past tense of seek. What does it mean to seek God? That's a question for you and I want you to concentrate on it because there's a difference between looking for something and seeking something. If you lose an earring, you might spend... Uh, 10, 15 minutes searching for it. You're looking for it. You don't find it, eh, oh well. But if you are determined that you're not going to give up until you find it, you will keep looking and looking and looking until you find it. Therein is the difference between looking for something and seeking. And so David says, I sought the Lord, which means David spent time in seeking God. He, 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 he looked for God. He spent time getting to know God and wanting to know God and, and getting to know God better. And that's one of the things that I would uh, implore us to do is spend some time, some quality time to get to know God better, to seek to know him better uh, as it relates to you and, and, and your personal uh, relationship with him. And, and, and there's a benefit in seeking God. Turn with me to Jeremiah. I want you to turn I love Jeremiah. I know you do too. Jeremiah chapter um, 29. And most of us are familiar with 20, chapter 29 because it says about, um, I know the thoughts I have for you, but we're going to go past that to verse 13. Jeremiah 29, 13. I'll give you a chance to find it. And it reads, and you, this is God speaking, and you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So that's what seeking is. When you, when you search for something with all your heart. And it says, and you will seek me. Not look for me. Not spend five minutes with me every now and then. But when you seek me. When you, when you go after me. Uh, there was a song. Uh, my granddaughter used to teach praise dance. And she had the kids dancing uh, to a song called Seeking After God. And it was quite a it was quite a, a, a illustration of what it means to seek God. They were really into it. I don't know who recorded that song, but it was called "Seeking After God." And so when we seek God, it's more than just eh, I, I'm, I know God. You have a determination. 
You have a determined intentionality to go after God and to get to know him. So again, it says, and you will seek me and find me, which means it's not a lost time, a lost cause, when you search for me with all your heart. So that, that's what David says, that he, he sought the Lord. He didn't just uh, go after him once. He, his, his life was built around seeking God. And, it's, and he heard me, which means that David, David writes in Psalm uh, 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 40 that, let me make sure I, I give you the right scripture. He says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. So there's some time investment in seeking God. And when you seek God, God, it's not that God has a hearing problem and he doesn't hear you right away. He does. But his time schedule and hours is different. But you still don't lose focus and give up because you pray to God. And in David's seeking, he prayed for God to deliver him from where he was. He said, and he heard me. How do I know? Because he said, and delivered me from all my fears. That's David's writing here in verse number four. And I want to explain to you about fear. Now, you're going to see that word fear again in verse number seven. But there are two different meanings to this word fear. Here in this particular verse, the word fear, and I'm going to try and pronounce it, the Hebrew word, it's make ura. And uh, you'll see it on your screen. And it means to be frightened or anxious about something. So David says, uh, God delivered him from all that. You know, uh, turn with me to 2 Timothy 1.7. Timothy is all the way in the back of the Bible. Before you get, it's those three T's. First, second Timothy, Thessalonians, and all that. But Timothy. Second Timothy 1, 7. Okay, are we there yet? All right. Second Timothy 1, 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. So this Fear, this anxiousness, this being frightened, is not a spirit that we got from God. Fear is an emotion. And all of our emotions come from God. But it's not a spirit. A spirit is something that takes over and, and, and embodies itself in you. And God hasn't given you the emotion to be frightened on a long-term basis. So what David is saying here, God delivered him from being frightened and afraid. Let me read it again. He says, deliver me from all my fears. So David evidently had some things that he was afraid of. And God, by him seeking God, God delivered him. Which tells us that if we're dealing with any fear in our life, God can deliver you from those fears. It, it may not happen overnight, but don't give up. Keep seeking God. Keep going to God. Keep explaining to God. I'm not explaining Keep the, exclaiming God for who he is and how merciful and kind he is. And know for sure, because First Timothy, 2 Timothy tells us that this spirit didn't come from God. That what he gave us was a sound mind and power. That came from God. But to be walking around in fear, to be frightened or afraid or anxious about something, that feeling, that fear, that long-term fear in that area did not come from God. And then turn with me also, we're still, let's, let's go to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. Uh, that's, we we're close to it, so our study is 34. So go to 27, uh, verses 1 through 3. And it said, are you there yet? Psalm 27, 1 through 3. This is another good psalm. This is David again. He says, the Lord is my light and my salvation, personal. The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked came against me to eat up my flesh, my enemies and foes, they stumbled and fell. Though an army may encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war may rise against me, in this I will be confident. And so David is saying again, I sought the Lord. And because I know he is my light and my salvation, because I know this salvation here means he protects me. Because I know that I'm not going to live in fear. And David, and I want you to have that same attitude about fear. God, it's not God's intention that we would walk around being afraid of anything. Be cautious, yeah. 
but don't don't live in fear. So if you're dealing with anything in your life that causes you to be frightful or afraid, that's not God's intention for you, beloved. It is not. And when you seek God with this situation, he will deliver you. Just like he delivered David. God doesn't love David any more than he loves you. So it's just like he delivered David, he will deliver you as well. Amen? And then it goes on. Verse number five says, they look, they, meaning the umbo that they talked about up in, up in verse number two, they looked to him and were radiant, and their faces were not ashamed. What is David saying here? That in times of darkness, in times of darkness, uh, the humble, they, us, all of us, are brightened, are made glad to the point that their countenance changed. Psalm 4, 6, and 7, go there with me. Psalm 4, go all the way back. Verses 6 and 7. And it says, There are many who say, Who will show us any good? Lord, Lift up the light of your countenance upon us. You have put gladness in my heart more than in the season that their grain and wine increased. And so they're saying, God, I need the light of your countenance. I need your joy. I need your happiness. And how many of you know that your inside emotions show on your face? So when you are, when you are upset, it shows. And I have such, my face, Lord have mercy, it gives me away all the time. I cannot hide how I feel. Got me in trouble a few times. Uh, you should have seen the look on your face. Well, I'm sorry. That's just who I am. Not making excuses. But my point is, when you have the joy of the Lord, when you know who God is, there's a difference in your countenance. Even when you're going through, you don't walk around with your head hung down in shame. You don't, you don't, uh, uh, act like you don't know who God is. There's an inner joy that, that radiates from you when you know who God is. And David said, I sought the Lord. So when we seek God, God gives us a radiance and it emanates from the inside. It's not something, it's not our makeup, ladies. It's from the inside out. And people, people, and it's easily recognizable. People see the joy in you when you know who God is, when you know that God is your deliverer, when you know that your salvation came from Jesus Christ, when you know that he's your peace, he's, he's, your, he's your, 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 your comforter, when you know all that, there's a radiance about you that you just don't get bummed out of shape easily. And people can see it. Many people on your job in particular say, I don't know how you do it. And that's because you know God. It doesn't mean you don't have any problems. I used to work in an office and I had a habit of humming, and I, I tried to do it within me so I wouldn't disturb anybody. And this lady was going through some situations, and she told me, nobody's that happy all the time. Well, you don't know my personal life. I had issues too, but you didn't know it because what you saw in me was the joy of the Lord. I chose, rather than to, to, to live in disharmony and to live like I lost my last friend, was to show what it means to love God and to have the love of God in my life. And so David is saying, he says, they looked to him and were radiant and their faces were not ashamed. So when we, when we, when we know and trust God, it gives us a radiance where we reflect no fear, no burdens. Doesn't mean we don't have any, no worry lines, ladies, and no frowns. And I don't know about you, but I like that part about no worry lines. You know how vain we can get sometimes. But anyway, when you trust God and you have faith in God, you have, David says, you have that radiance. You have the countenance of God in you, and it shows, and people can see it. And then verse number, and then it talks about they, the they that they talked about, I think explained it, that they was the humble in verse 2. And then again, humility shows in your personality and your character. And we've done a lot of study in this Bible study lessons about humility and uh, character. So that's important. And then verse six, verse six then David gets, gets personal again. He says, this poor man cried out and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. What is David saying? The poor man here in Hebrew, it's related to humility, to being humble. That's what it means. And so the Lord is your representative in affliction and humility for David. 
no matter what David was going through, God was his representative. And he's always also. And so David was a poor man who could only cry out to God and God saved him. And poor means he was, um, he was humble in his spirit towards God. And he cried out to God and God saved him. And I want you to know that even in our weak, our weaknesses and the things that we go through or the mistakes we make, they're not liabilities when we trust God because God has given us a way out. Turn with me to Second Chronicles. We're all over the Bible tonight. Aren't you glad? I just love this because I like it when you unstick those pages and, and go to some places that you ain't been in a minute. And this is a very familiar passage of scripture. You've probably heard it preached a zillion times. And um, I might even get into it one of these days myself and doing Bible study because it's very rich. Uh, and this, this is, I call this God's solution to our situations, if you will. God says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, first condition, humility. God is looking for a, hum for a humble and contrite spirit. That's what God's looking for. He says, if they would humble themselves and pray and seek my face, there's that word again, and turn from their wicked ways, then, key word, when they do all of this, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Now, our land is not necessarily talking about America. It's any situation that you may be in at that particular time. It could be your pride. It could be any number of things. But your healing comes when you do what God has, has, has petitioned you to do here. He says, again, I'll read it. And in my Bible, the word my is capitalized, which signifies that it's, it's reverence to God. This is God. This ain't just any my. It's God. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. And so uh, these are the conditions that God gave to Solomon when he built the temple and all that, but that's that study. But this, this particular scripture, prescript, prescription, I should say, is a prescription for all of us. So even you're not, your 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 problems that you're dealing with, David is trying to get us to see that they're not liabilities when we trust God. When we do these things, then when we pray, the Bible, he says, when you pray and seek my face, those are two words we, we, we see again. When you do that, you know, God, deliverance is right around the corner. So David is giving you his testimony, but that's a reality for us too. We, we can do that. We can do that when we do that. And, uh, and then verse number seven says, the angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. Now there's that word fear again. But I want to understand, explain to you that that fear doesn't mean anxiety. This is another Hebrew word, and the pronunciation is yare, and it spells Y-A-R-E. And it means an awe, or a reverence for God. And it was asked me, how do you know the difference? Well, when you're reading the scriptures, and as you read and with, with clarity and understanding, the Spirit will help you to understand the difference and sometimes uh sometimes when people say oh i'm just I'm, I'm afraid of god it's not an anxious fear it's a reverential fear that you are you are cautious about disturbing god's peace that's 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 what that means it doesn't mean that you're shaking around him but that you are so you're cautious to do what he wants you to do and because you reverence him so because he is so important to you that you have this Yahweh, which is, that's the fear we're talking about here. So remember the one up in, the, up in verse number four meant that the, the shaking and anxiety, that's that fear. But this fear here is talking about the reverence of God. And I hope you understand it. If you don't just shoot me an email and I'll do my best to explain it to you. Okay. But that's what I want you to understand. Because again, when you re even when you read it, it doesn't imply of being afraid. Listen to what it says again. The angel of the Lord encamps around all those who fear him. Why would you be anxious and shaken with an angel camping around you? You wouldn't. That that the presence of the angel gives you a peace. 
So if this angel is encamped around you to protect you, why would you be anxious? So, so even in, except in the reading of it, and I'm sure when you read it in an NIV or other translations, there probably is another word there. And so it's good, and I share with people all the time, go to other translations, particularly the NIV or, or the newest, some of the new translations, to get a clearer uh, verbiage than what we get in King James, even the new King James. Uh, I'm not a... Uh, I'm not an opponent of the King James. I don't oppose it, but sometimes it's just not quite as clear as some of your newer translations. Amen? And so I just want you to know, when you see that fear, that fear does not mean that you're scared of God. It just means you reverence Him, and you care so much about pleasing Him that you don't want to mess up. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. We're going to move on. Move on. Okay. And then... In verse number eight, David sends another invitation to us. It says, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts him. Now, this blessed means happy. Happy is the man who trusts in him. Um, David extends this invitation. He invites us to perform a taste test about something that he has discovered. And what it is is David is saying, it's not enough just to hear about a feast, but to know its true value, you have to taste it. So it's not enough just to hear about God. You've got to individually and personally taste God for yourself, is what David is saying here. And he's inviting you. Why? He said, because blessed is the man who trusts in him. And I don't know about you, but I want God's blessings. I want God's blessings. And the feast that we, he talks about is free. In Isaiah 55 and 1, uh, let's go there and see what it says. Isaiah, back to Isaiah. Isaiah 55 and 1. It says, Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come buy and eat. Yes, come buy wine and milk without money, without price. So the feast that David is talking about, tasting and seeing, is free. Don't cost you nothing except some time to get into the word and to seek God. Now, uh, what is our conclusion? Our conclusion is uh, it's only by experiencing God and trusting God, tasting if you will, that we will know of his goodness. Amen. Uh, 1 Peter 2, 3. I'm going to go there. Write that down in your notes. 1 Peter 2, 3. We got time to go to one more, one more scripture. 1 Peter 2, 3. It says, as newborn babes, desire the sincere, pure milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. So you want to know and to taste and see that God is, that God is who he say he is. And you only do find the information of the evidence of that when you seek him. When you take the time to, to seek God and to spend some time in his presence and with him alone. Your yeah, alone time with God counts. It's countless. It's, it's immeasurable, I should say, when you spend time in the presence of God along with God. And so any good thing in your anything good in your life has its origin in God. Any, anything good has your origin. So when we spend quality time reflecting on the goodness of God in our personal life, we will see the difference. We will experience the difference in the way we see our future. And even uh, if our circumstances, and I want to point this out, even if your circumstances don't change right away, the way you perceive them will change. You get that? It may not change, but the way you understand and perceive it, the way you approach it will change. Because now you're seeing it through the will and the eyes of God, how he wants you to perceive it. You see it with the knowledge that God also knows. And that makes a big difference when you're going through something. And so uh, make make your praise, as we said last week, a point. Make praise a point of, a, a give, give praise, I should say, a point of prominence in your life. Because David, even though he's, he's here, he's explaining some things, he's still praising God. Because remember, we saw, we talked um, uh, in last week about the different ways of praise and verbally, David is verbally praising God here. So remember our resolution was to, to bless God, to praise God, to uh, to bless God, to praise God at all times. And, and, and 
that's still a part of what David is doing here. And as we go through the rest of this study, you're gonna, David's going to further explain reasons why we have, as born-again believers, the reasons we have to praise him. Next week, we're going to be studying verses 9 through 14. So you get a chance, find some time to study those, and we'll come back next week, and we'll study those verses, and we'll see uh, where we get with that. And there's some good stuff in those verses as well. Amen. So let us pray. Father God, again, we thank you for this time together. We thank you, Lord, that you've allowed us the privilege of being in your presence, God. We thank you, Lord, for what you've allowed us to do today. And we thank you, God, that you just got all by yourself. And I pray for the audience that they will learn how to experience you in ways that they may not have experienced you before. And as David said, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. I pray that you will be a part of their spiritual menu from now on and that daily they will feed themselves on your word. Bless us now, we pray, and we ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Until next week, go with God and be blessed.